Hello, I think we can start as uh, latecomers uh, come in. Uh, welcome all and uh, good day wherever you are. It's really a great pleasure to welcome you at the Garrett Research Seminar this week. And for those of you new to the seminars, uh, Nick uh, Petek Surgeon and I have had the privilege of organizing uh, the seminars for this term uh, on behalf of the Department of Archaeology and the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research at Cambridge. And this spring, we've been exploring historical ecologies of scales across uh, um, different uh, uh, disciplines and cultures and periods engaging the past to inform the present, very much inspired by um, the contribution of Dorothy Garrod to interdisciplinary research and engagement with local communities and indigenous communities. And the seminars have been taking us across different ecologies, cultures and periods, and I encourage you uh, to check our program on the departmental website and also to check our departmental YouTube channel where you can find full details of previous and upcoming seminars, but also watch uh, those that you might have missed uh, so far. Before introducing our speaker uh, today, uh, can we ask you to keep your mic mute during uh, the talk um, at the question through the chat and we'll give you instruction later on. Um, now, it is really a great pleasure uh, to welcome um, Dr. Chelsea Gerarda Armstrong, Assistant Professor in Indigenous Studies at Simon Fraser University and Director of the Historical Ethno-Ecological Research Lab. She's also a board member of directors of the Society of Ethnobiology and review editor of the journal Human Ecology. Uh, an historical ecologist and archaeologist, uh, Dr. Hamstrong has been pioneering research on, on ancient forests, gardens, and orchard systems, particularly in British Columbia, while she's also been exploring issues around indigenous practices, culturally salient plant species, and the role of colonialism in environmental and heritage management and policy, amongst the other topics that she engages with. A diverse research has been really advancing theoretical and methodological um, approaches to the study of ecosystems more generally, and under a headship, the Historical and Ethnoecology Research Lab is been integrating methods from archaeology, historical ecology, ethnoecology, functional botany, and uh, molecular biology, and lots more. And a recent research has been able to reconstruct our ancient historical management practices have influenced plant functional trait distribution, but also plant diversity. And therefore, we are really extremely grateful to welcome uh, Dr. Armstrong here to us, particularly uh, grateful that she, she's been able to fit this seminar in, in between uh, various fieldwork commitments. And um, welcome, the floor is yours. You might now share your screen. Thank you. Okay, everyone can see that and hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about uh, the historical ecology of forest gardens and orchards uh, in the Pacific Northwest, focusing specifically on archaeological and ecological signatures. And just to situate everyone, this is the Pacific Northwest of North America. And all the research I'll be discussing today is based in British Columbia, Canada, um, which is characterized, as some of you may know, by fairly mountainous terrain, very deeply incised river valleys, vast conifer forests, composed mostly of western hemlock, western red cedar, spruce, pine. And today I am calling from Simshian Lachyap or Simshian territory up here in the Northwest, that's Vancouver down there. 
Um, and this is where I live and where I work. It's a fairly large indigenous territory composed of roughly eight nations um, or composed of eight nations and uh, roughly the size of Estonia. Um, so quite a big expanse of land. Um, and my research is pretty firmly grounded in the governing frameworks of a few of the nations in this area, which I'll talk about today. But it's important to note that all of or most of British Columbia is unceded territory, uh, which means First Nations never ceded their territories to the Crown or to the Canadian government through either treaty, capitulation, or any other agreement. And this becomes quite relevant since in our work documenting, you know, so-called Indigenous land use history, it's become important um, for some nations who are seeking rights and title to their territories. It's, it's land use is, uh, in some cases, a, a benchmark for nations seeking self-determination, uh, which I'll talk a bit about at the end of this presentation. But thinking about land use history, uh, as some of you may know, and as you've uh, no doubt heard about in the previous talks in this uh, series, Archaeologists have really come to recognize the importance of human land use history, especially as it relates to ecological legacies in a lot of ecosystems around the world. For example, globally, um, ancient and historic land use activities continue to influence forest structure, forest functions, sometimes centuries or even millennia after those activities have ceased. So some of the common examples here in the Americas include Maya forest gardens, Amazonian dark earths, which continue to influence forest structure and composition uh, in the Amazon, Mala agroforestry, which has uh, naturalized in some cases in Hawaii, and fire adapted beech nut forests are um, really interesting example of, of landscapes that have been encouraged by indigenous peoples for some 2000 years and which still continue to grow today. So while most Indigenous communities know something about the way their lived landscapes have been managed, scientists are, are really only starting to catch up. For example, we know actually very little about ancient land use or historical land use legacies in forest systems in Canada. There's actually not a, a lot of research out there on this topic. And one of the reasons for this we think is that land use legacies are, are first very challenging to document. Uh, this is especially true if the management strategies were meant to mimic or merely enhance natural processes. So one of the approaches used by historical ecologists like myself is to look at a contemporary forest and ask, how did it get this way? And a key here is to look at both cultural and biophysical processes and where neither is necessarily the protagonist. So for example, to document historical and ancient forest management here in BC, some of the things that we might look for include plant communities associated with archeological village sites, plant species growing outside their natural range or natural habitat, plant assemblies that are more rich or more diverse. Um, and of course, plant assemblies that are ethnobotanically significant. And this is uh, not an entirely new or novel concept. In the 1920s, Smithsonian researcher Alex Hardlika was working in Alaska and later wrote about dozens of ecosystems throughout Alaska whose plant communities reflected past Indigenous land use. He says one of the main results of these expeditions has been the location of literally hundreds of ancient village sites these sites present wide and in some cases seemingly absolute botanical differences from the rest of the region. With some experience, it is possible to detect such a site. Its vegetation is darker and much richer in development, and some of these plants apparently exist nowhere else in the region. And he goes on to list uh, stinging nettle, cow parsnip, red elderberry, monk's hood, and fireweed, and other flowering plants as people indicators. <clears throat> 
And of course, beyond the composition and vigor of contemporary plant communities, people know that their ancestors affected the assembly processes of different vegetation in a given area. And this is the case throughout BC and throughout most of my work. The elders are always telling us about these things before we're telling them about them. So Alex Bolton from Kitsum Kalem here, for example, he says that old villages are the best places to hunt because that's where all the broadleaf tree browse is. Uh, Claudette Charlie uh, from Chehalis here, she notes that in her territory, where apples grow, uh, people once lived. And she's referencing here Malus fusca or Pacific crab apple, which is a quote, wild species, but often associated with uh, habitation sites, village sites. Fred and Morris Mason from Kitsilas territory here, they say that the best fruit trees are always near old villages. And Stacy Marie and Chris Arnett have often commented on how fruit trees and shrubs tend to aggregate near Inklakapmach rock art sites. So lots of, of different kind of um, tidbits and snippets of information. But another reason why we know so little about historical land use and forest management in BC is because of some, because of some very uh, problematic stereotypes that continue to plague uh, Western science and, and even popular culture. So one of those stereotypes, and you, you all may have heard of this, uh, is that Indigenous peoples in the Pacific Northwest were funneled into this category of complex hunter-gatherers. And that despite very uh, densely occupied and stratified societies, they weren't interested in terrestrial landscapes, right? They were more focused on marine and riverine foods like salmon. And so there's this longstanding idea, again, even in popular culture, that Indigenous peoples broadly uh, just didn't use the landscape and that they were even to some extent, some folks have argued that they were cavalier about many of the resources in their territories. Um, and this narrative, in addition to being problematic in academia, also helped fuel settler colonialism and justify a lot of land grabs across the Northwest. Of course, now we know that vegetal foods like camas, uh, wapato, berry crops, uh, in some cases made up the majority of people's diets. Um, you can read a lot more about this from the decades of work that Nancy Turner has done. This is her most recent edited volume on the topic. But that aside, this idea of complex hunter-gatherers is a very oversimplified and I think outdated colonial narrative, but it still permeates archeological interpretations of land use. And it requires a lot of unlearning. Um, not to mention, you know, to pool everyone in the Pacific Northwest into this, you know, three termed categories is really problematic. I mean, we're talking about a lot of cultural diversity here. So just in British Columbia, there's 11, well, I should say there's 11 language families, indigenous language families in Canada. Uh, seven of those are in BC. So when we talk about indigenous land use, even just in this province, we're articulating an incredible amount of diversity, uh, not just through space, but also through time. Oh, sorry. So just getting back to this idea of um, diversity of practices and the kind of pigeonhole that we've put, we as a um, discipline have put indigenous practices into has been really hard to undo. And really these broad stroke narratives or very surface level analyses of, of uh, land use often don't meet the same scientific rigor with which we study say non-human systems. And so this is the task of the historical ecologists. We're here to use practical and, and evidence-based frameworks, but also as Carol Crumley says, open-ended narratives which really challenge uh, some racial and colonial assumptions. And it's this that helps us build a more accurate understanding of past interactions between people and plants and forests. And one of the ways that we can do this uh, is looking at something like translocations. This is a, a really good starting point to think about all these different pieces. So human assisted Biological invasions uh, are without a doubt one of the great threats to Earth's ecosystems, but 
species introductions um, and invasions extend very deep into the human past and are one of the most long-standing plant management strategies that archaeologists are aware of. So people have been moving Kelsey, I think you you muted, muted by accident. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Where did I where did I cut off? Uh, translocation. You just started. Uh, just started. Okay. So uh, just quickly again. So uh, humans have been moving plants, uh, you know, both domesticated and wild species, so long as they've been moving around the globe, these species introductions and invasions extend very deep into the human past. And um, they're one of the most longstanding management practices that archeologists are aware of. And so while some plant ranges here in BC might appear to look wild and they're articulated as such, they are in fact the result of ancient trance or ancient plant translocation. So people have been moving favorable species throughout their homelands throughout time. Uh, Nancy Turner, Dana Lepofsky, and I recently published a paper on this. Uh, and we outline a kind of multi-method approach that uses ethnographic, um, historical, ecological, archeological, phytogeographic data. And we combine this evidence to show um, how we can document ancient plant movements, specifically here in so-called BC. Um, so we compiled these lines of evidence spanning various uh, spatial and temporal scales. And we concluded that where a species was referenced in three or more lines of evidence, it was probably a good candidate for human assisted movement. So some of the plants that turned up in our analyses were things like Saskatoon berry, camas, hazelnut, hawthorn, Pacific crabapple, nicotiana, uh, and, and there's quite a few. And just to give you an example with one species of how these lines of evidence can overlap, uh, we'll look at hazelnut. So hazelnut is uh, the only native nut tree or shrub in BC. It's a shrubby deciduous plant that produces very uh, nutrient rich and oily nuts. The wood and early shoots also have countless uses. Uh, and we know from Gixan and Enklakatmach elders that hazelnut was often managed using prescribed fires. And we know that it was likely transplanted long distances. This is uh, Marion Dixon Welchotko. Uh, she's an Enklakatmach elder who was able to escape residential school by hiding under the floorboards of her grandmother's house. And so she's articulated, she said this is important for people to know because it meant that she got to live as she says in the old way. And she remembers hazelnut as being one of the most important plants for her and her family. And when it comes to managing hazelnuts, she says around our home, yeah, you take hazelnut, just plant them so they're all together. That was my job in the spring. So when you go out to harvest them in the fall, they're all in one spot, more like you do with apples, you know, you transplant them. Marion has said that over half of the hazelnut in the Coquihalla region of BC in the Southern interior is there because of her and her family. And again, when ecologists or scientists are looking at the range of hazelnut, this is not something that they're thinking about. So Marion and, and Nancy and I have worked for years trying to better understand the spatial distribution of hazelnut in the province. And we actually suspect that this disjunct population here in northwestern BC was part of ancient translocation events. Hazelnut has more or less, more or less naturalized uh, in the town of Hazelton. So there's a town called Hazelton here, and it's named after an early uh, colonial geographer who was coming up the Skeena River in the 1890s and he noted like this very strange hazelnut that was the kind of dominant sub canopy of the landscape. So we decided to call the town Hazelton. Uh, now provincially there's two varieties of hazelnut. So we have uh, Californica variety in blue here and this uh, grows in Southern BC and down into uh, Washington and Oregon and California where it gets its name. And there's an interior variety here uh, called Cornuda Cornuda. And what's interesting is that morphologically, 
the hazelnut in the north of the province is more similar to the California variety. Uh, and this is, of course, interesting because previously this was thought to be a disjunct or isolated population from a previously larger distribution. And if that was the case, you know, this would, would have extended this population or um, variety would have extended into the region and then be cut off by uh, a geological event like a glacier or some such. But in fact, it's, it's more similar to the species down here, or variety down here. Adding another line of evidence, um, you know, so we know about transplanting from Marion and from others, but also when you look at the paleobiolinguistic data, it's an interesting story. So the Simshanic word for hazelnut, the, specifically the Gixan word in the Simshanic language family is called skan se'ech. So skan referring to any shrubby plant and se'ech referring specifically to the nut. This is the um, almost exact same word that is uh, given for the in the uh, Halkamalem language, but also the Proto Salish language, uh, te'ech. And so we believe that it was very likely uh, a loan word. These are not, these are entirely different language families. So it's impossible that the words would be cognates. And so it's very likely that it was a loan word, and we believe a loan nut. And zooming. Uh, a bit more back to this population around the settler town of Terrace, where I'm calling from today, there are only a few isolated pockets of hazelnut. It's, it's not um, something you see often in the area. It's only in a few isolated spots. Uh, and those are exclusively archeological village sites. So places like Gitlitzau, Gikseich, and Dalkialakia, which I'll talk about. Before getting into that, the archeology span piece, um, just talking about management again, focusing though on Pacific crabapple. This is a, a really another good example worth looking at when we talk about these different lines of evidence of, of kind of human assisted migrations and management and impact on their distribution. So this is a Pacific crabapple is a coastal species that prefer really the kind of outer coast moist to wet shorelines. Um, they're especially common on coastal islets, but as you move inland from the coast, uh, they're not as common. And uncoincidentally, inland, they usually only grow in two spots, and that's on reserve and at archaeological village sites. <clears throat> so Pacific crabapple is one of four native crabapples to North America. The other three are all on the east coast. But it's unlike any of those. So the Pacific crab apple is very unique. Instead of kind of the large clusters of apples, it has very tiny, tiny fruits. It's about the size of your fingernail. Uh, and they feature very prominently in origin stories. Um, they're often associated with place names as well. So Mulks, as it's called in Somaliach, was a very powerful being uh, in some of the Somaliach or, or the Tsimshan origin stories. And it was a really important plant uh, for people's diets, it could be harvested in just massive quantities um, and, and very easily stored underwater. I've been told they can preserve underwater for up to eight months. Uh, and we do find them archaeologically uh, in plant assemblages. And just as an example here in New Chatlet and, and staying on the coast of or um, thinking about this idea of, of what the vegetation looks like, right? So not just its distribution, but like Hardlika said, flagging vegetation that maybe looks darker, it looks richer, or it's otherwise unique. Here on Apple Islet in New Chatlet territory, um, there's a hundred or more Pacific crab apples that grow on this island, but they're just absolutely incredible. This, this plant is, is, it's more shrubby than it is tree-like, but in this area, it's, it's these absolutely massive stands of crab apple. For those of you that have um, interacted with this plant at all, it's, these are just the biggest ones we've ever seen, and they're arranged almost in rows. They're nicely spaced. They have a beautiful um, sparse canopy. They dominate the canopy, but it's, it's quite sparse. Um, and below the site, this, this orchard site, there's an intertidal root garden, which is a common form of management here on the coast. Uh, 
uh, where people were harvesting, um, tilling, gardening, root crops like um, Pacific silverweed, uh, rice root lily, spring bank clover. So it's a very interesting landscape. Now, again, this is something that's not recognized often in archeological literature or ecological literature that, that people would be involved in this practice. Remember, they're, they're just eating salmon, right? Interestingly though, one of the earliest accounts we have of fruit tree management in BC comes from Gilbert Sprout in 1868. And he noted, so an area just adjacent to New Chatlet, he said, crab apples are wrapped in leaves and preserved in bags for the winter. The method of cooking them when fresh plucked is by simply boiling the apples. But when they have lost their acidity, they are cooked by being placed over a hole, placed in a hole dug in the ground over which green leaves are placed and a fire kindled above. The natives are as careful of their crab apples as we are of our orchards. And it is a sure sign of losing heart before intruding whites when in the neighborhood of their settlements, of settlements, they sullenly cut down their crab apple trees in order to gather the fruit for the last time without trouble as the tree lies on the ground. So it's important to remember that all these populations, all these plants we talk about, whether it's Pacific crab apple, hazelnut, Saskatoon, these are all considered wild species. And, and you know, that in some essence means that they don't have any or much human influence. And again, the standing assumption among archaeologists in this region is that in the Pacific Northwest, people maybe did manage plants, but not to an extent that it would affect plant community composition in any significant way. Now, this process of interrogating cultural and biophysical lines of evidence to understand human land use history also led to the recovery of indigenous forest gardens. So forest gardens are semi-open forests of small fruit and nut trees and fruit shrubs and edible herbaceous root foods and medicines. Broadly speaking, they have um, a, a kind of canopy or sub canopy layer of hazelnut and Pacific crab apple, but also wild cherries, red elderberries, black hawthorn, Saskatoon berries. There's often a shrub layer of salmonberry, various species of blueberries, huckleberries, so vacciniums, rubus, uh, and a ground layer of things like wild onion, northern rice root, wild ginger, and other uh, edible or medicinal plants. And I should say the characterization of these layers uh, certainly varies from site to site, especially between the north and the south of the province or sites that are closer to the coast versus those that are closer to the interior. And we're just starting collaboratively and collectively to get a better, better handle on um, these forest management systems. But we know that they occur exclusively at archeological village sites or at ancestral sites and campsites. With my colleagues, we've now identified 14 forest gardens throughout BC. Uh, and that's in partnership with Tisleiwatooth, Chehalis, Nuchatlet, Gitgada, Gitanyao, Kitsilis, and Kitsimkalem nations. So quite a broad coverage culturally and ecologically. And interestingly, in two cases, uh, the assembly of forest garden species actually helped us to identify archeological sites. So in one case, I came across what looked to be a, a naturally occurring forest garden. I thought, okay, these are, there are natural ones. This isn't, you know, um, just happening with people. But after talking and working with community collaborators at Kitsilis, um, we did a few shovel tests and we actually identified a previously unrecorded archeological site. And so, um, you know, not only is this great for archeologists as a maybe another handy tool for identifying sites, but it also confirms that there really are no natural analogs to these ecosystems. Despite the fact that a lot of these species, and I know for some of you, you might not recognize a lot of the plants that I'm naming, um, they, they are native to BC, they do grow kind of individually, quote, in the wild, but it's the specific, the specific assembly of all these species together, all these ethnobotanically important plants all together, and that's what we really flag. Uh, here we go. So last 
spring, my colleagues and I published a paper looking at uh, biodiversity and functional diversity of forest gardens and focusing on four sites, one uh, or sorry, two here in some Shan territory and then down here into Tsleil-Waututh and Chehalis territories. We chose these four sites because they were all consistently occupied uh, starting at least 2000 years ago. And at all four sites, people either left the villages or were forcibly removed under colonial policies by the 1870s. And so at each of these sites, these forest garden sites, we did botanical inventories within the forest garden, but also within the adjacent conifer forests, what you would think of as a kind of your classic Northwest coast conifer forest. And in all cases, those conifer forests are on the edge of the forest gardens. And in some cases, and I'll talk about, they appear to be encroaching. But we did uh, botanical inventories and, and, and mapping the forest gardens and the archaeological village sites. And comparing them, what we found uh, was a very clear pattern. So perhaps not surprisingly, the top two indicator species of forest gardens at all sites were crabapple, hazelnut, but also other edible uh, and important plant foods like um, high bush cranberry, red elderberry, some of the ones I've been naming. And the periphery or conifer forest sites, again, it included things that we expected as indicator species of those ecosystems. So things like Western hemlock, Western red cedar, red alder. But if you look at the uh, ethnobotanical significance of forest garden indicators, it's also interesting because they're almost all edible stored species. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, if you're uh, keen enough, you can eat almost anything for a small window, even if it's leafy greens or maybe some spruce tips or you, there's almost anything you can eat for a small window of the year. But whether or not you can harvest something in large quantities and you can store it over the long term, that really influences the kind of salience or importance of a plant species for people. And so when you think of plants that you can store and tend or that you can tend and store over the long term and they grow near the home, that's that's the very definition of a garden and why we started calling these places forest gardens. And of course, as some of you may know, the term uh, is borrowed from similar agroforestry practices uh, in the neotropics. And, and a lot of this work was informed by Annabelle Ford, who does uh, similar work in um, with Maya forest gardens. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with that body of research. We also looked at the biodiversity of the forest gardens and um, the kind of ambient ecosystems within which they grow. And what we found, again, unsurprisingly, that forest gardens were more biologically di diverse. Uh, and that's, you can tell when you're just walking through these spaces, there's just a lot more to uh, name and a lot more evenness of the things you're naming. <clears throat> And so we wanted to understand that a bit more. And now functional diversity is a, um, a really interesting metric to understand how ecosystems uh, function essentially. And so we know that forest gardens are more rich, which means they're likely to provide a suite of functions that perhaps the conifer forests don't. So we wanted to know what those functions were. And to do that, we looked at plant traits. Uh, three traits specifically we looked at were seed mass, pollination and dispersal syndrome, and we compared those traits across all sites. And what we found, so you can see here, seed mass was significantly higher in the forest gardens, and that makes sense. Uh, a larger seed means a larger fruit, and that's often the economically important part for humans, but also larger seeds are harder to self-pollinate. And they may require an extra hand, literally a, a human hand to propagate, probably vegetatively. So all these species will um, reproduce by seed sexually uh, in the quote wild, but to get all these things growing together in one spot, typically you're propagating vegetatively and that requires human assistance in a lot of cases. And so right away, this tells us that these species aren't likely to assemble without some kind of commensal relationship with people. Um, I've collapsed the, the last two traits because they're very similar and they had essentially the same value. 
And all this is saying is that forest gardens have a much higher frequency of animal dispersed and animal pollinated species. So this means that forest gardens are the result of animal movement. And of course, humans are included in that category. But on top of that, what this suggested was that after people departed from their villages or were forcibly moved, you know, 150 years ago when these places were, were left, uh, forest gardens began providing unique habitat for animals and pollinators seeking food. These are, you know, really huge biodiverse breaks in otherwise continuous conifer forest. Um, at all these sites, moose, bear, and deer are especially common. And going back to what the elders say, they, the elders know that, right? Like Alex Bolton said, old villages are just the best places to hunt. And people talk often about returning to the villages in the 50s and 60s because they were the best places to hunt. So when we think about forest gardens and people's legacies on the landscape, you know, not only were forest gardens providing important services for people in the past, but they continue to provide important functions and services in the present. When you think of land use legacies or human land use legacies, we often have this idea that they're, they're very negative impacts on the landscape. But in fact, there can be um, instances where people are increasing that biodiversity, increasing that functional diversity in really uh, impactful ways. So one of the places, just to give you guys an idea of the, the archaeology of it all, um, one of the places we've been doing a more intensive study uh, on a kind of site scale is here at Gixeich in uh, Kitzlas territory. So Gixeich is just one village in a complex of many village sites spanning about 6,000 years of occupation in this canyon here called the Kitzlas Canyon. Um, very, very rich archaeological landscape. And the Gixeic landscape is here at the head of the canyon. And just to give you an idea of what it looks like, the site includes 17 house platforms. So you can see a um, drawing here of the house platforms. And they, they sit on this first terrace above the Skeena River. Uh, and then just above another terrace behind that is this kind of core forest garden complex. And then behind that is this periphery conifer forest that I was um, talking about in the previous slides. Now there's been a few um, excavations in the rest of the canyon, but no excavations here at Gixaic. So um, there's been no dating of the site, but archeologists, previous archeologists like Gary Copeland and George McDonald who were working there in the eighties, uh, they suggested that it was probably occupied only 250 years uh, before present. So not a, a very, very recent site. With the nation, the Kitsilis nation, uh, last summer with one of their youth programs, we did a field school uh, that included all sorts of work and research and data collection. We did some um, high level soil analyses. We did LIDAR and drone mapping and paleoethnobotanical analyses. And we did some dendro chronological work, and that was to ascertain the stand age structure uh, of both forest gardens and periphery forests. So we cored trees, dated them, and what we found were that individual species or individuals like Pacific crabapple are older, much older than the uh, conifer forests or conifer trees on the edge of both ecosystems. So this confirms what we thought that conifers are actually kind of slowly encroaching into the forest garden. But at the same time, this encroachment is happening very, very slowly. Um, the Pacific Northwest is an incredibly productive area. Its forests typically regenerate within a matter of decades. Um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon to, after a logging event or a, a light forest fire for forests to regenerate within a few decades, it'll start with some red alder. And then that's slowly replaced by things like pine or cedar, hemlock, again, it, it, it's just, it regenerates so quickly. So the fact that these places persist, even after 150 years since people stopped managing there is, is really quite impressive. The soils also tell a really interesting, if cursory story. Um, here in 
So this is a kind of plain view of the site. So down here, A, this is the village site. Uh, within this bounded polygon is the forest garden. And on the outside here is this periphery forest. So in this kind of core village area, the soils are characterized by very um, kind of typical shellless midden. So there's about two meters of midden. Uh, so you can see Sierra here on the left with the backfill from an excavation unit. And it's just full of, of fire cracked rock and lithics and other fill. On the other end in the periphery conifer forest, the soils were characterized by um, relatively normal humiform structure. So very typical of forests in the region, which we call podzols. Um, so podzols, they have a very, um, a very distinct boundary between the organic layer and the mineral layer. And there's a leaching layer of, uh, or an AE layer, that white that you can see there. It's a very kind of classic um, soil structure. And you can see Natasha holding up that LFH layer. It's very bounded nicely. But in the forest garden soil, when we look at soils in this area, it's rather different from both. So apparent, uh, apparent in all our units was this mixing of the organic and mineral soil, some 40 centimeters of just very rich, rich black AH soils. Um, there were a few artifacts and in some cases, a few salmon bones, but nothing like the village. You know, there were no kind of discrete strata, paleosols or house floors. Um, it was very, very, uh, one of the actually soil scientists that we're working with, JT Cornelius uh, at UBC, you know, he was calling these our, our, our version of, of Amazonian dark earths. So Amazonian dark earths of the North. Um, the, we have uh, lots of, of, as I said, it's a little cursory. So we have some biochemical analysis that we're doing right now, but um, just really phenomenal kinds of, of soil going on here, soil formation. And there are some ethnographic accounts within community that, you know, when you're processing all your fish, what do you do with all those guts? while well, you put them back in the plants. That's a really common thing to fertilize with fish. And so this could be the result of just, um, you know, uh, decades, centuries, perhaps millennia of um, fertilizing and enhancing soil properties. The paleoethnobotanical evidence. So we uh, sampled for, for plant fossils. Uh, I worked with Natasha Lyons on this and I won't get into uh, too much of the details on this, but uh, in the forest gardens themselves, in these nice soils, we didn't actually find much by way of plant fossils, which didn't surprise us. You know, in this part of the world, whether it's um, conifer forest or broadleaf forest, paleoethnobotanical remains just don't preserve very well. Preservation is really poor. And as some of you may know, you really need to target features where they've been charred or otherwise desiccated. And so we ended up looking in some of the cultural depressions of the house area of the village site. Um, and it was incredible, you know, with a very small sample, Natasha identified 19 plant taxa, including hazelnut and crabapple seeds. We actually dated these, um, not only to quote pre-contact times, but um, also much older than the previous date of the site was believed to be. So we're looking at um, 430 and 480 calibrated years before present. I should say we have preliminary evidence on another site down south where we found in the forest garden um, hazelnut fragments that are 600 years old. So we continue to push this date back. This is only really preliminary research, but this jives with what community members uh, have always said about GigSafe, that the site is a lot older than archeologists said it was. And, and we're starting to, um, to see that. Now, this research has been uh, really interesting and fascinating, um, but it's, it's really nested within Kitzlis's desires to bring forest gardens back to life. So I've been working with the community garden coordinator, Patsy Drummond at the Kitzlis village. Um, and we've been preparing all sorts of kind of tests and pilot projects to establish forest gardens right back in the community. So that you know, archeological work, the soil analyses, the ethnographic data, they've all been really interesting, but they've also been instrumental into the process of 
building food sovereignty for the nation. So we've set up kind of experimental plots to, um, you know, taking, cutting back conifer trees that are slowly coming in, testing different soil, um, different soil uh, structures. So looking at these, you know, um, really rich black soils from the forest gardens and seeing how we can replicate those in the community forest garden. We've also um, taken hundreds of cuttings from all the species growing in the forest gardens and seeing which can root and be propagated and the, the success rate has been extremely high. And I'm going to shamelessly plug uh, my new book, which was a collaborative effort with the nation. Um, and it's kind of divided into two sections. So the first half of the book is a historical ecology of the canyon, but the second half is set up like a, a plant guide and it includes all sorts of directives from elders on how to manage plants, propagate plants, harvest plants, uh, all the processes needed to bring forest gardens back to life. And it includes about 70 species on and all their different um, attributes on growing and management. And finally, uh, I'll just finish on uh, some of the work that we uh, recently published and which was part of the New Chatlet lands claim case. So forest gardens and orchards were part of the swaths of evidence that the nation had to produce uh, that was just presented at a trial in the BC Supreme Court. So forest gardens are just a small part of this. There was a ton of other research, um, including other archeological research and ethnographic research so forest gardens played a small part, but they played a part. Um, you know, the Crown was using very racist and outdated ideas about New Chatlet people, uh, you know, saying they, they didn't have rights to their territory because they had abandoned it. Uh, you know, they were only small hunter-gatherer bands at the time of contact. They didn't use the land. But our collaborative research documenting orchards and forest gardens in their territory uh, showed the exact opposite. And so that was used as expert witness um, in the case to, to really confirm what people already knew on the ground, but in a legal framework needed to be uh, validated. Um, to quote Chief Jordan Michael here, he says, these forest gardens demonstrate how our laws were activated through our people and through the living knowledge of the land and the water itself. These ancient forest gardens were not tended by the British, they were stewarded by my people long before the queen even knew the taste of a crab apple. Uh, I'll also just uh, add another point to if you want to learn more about this and, and if you want to hear about forest gardens and forest management directly from the elders and the teachers, uh, community members like Willie Charlie and Stephanie Leon, uh, who interact with these places every day, I highly recommend this podcast by Future Ecologies. You know, I've been talking a lot about forest gardens over the last uh, few years, but this is, you know, really uh, their story to tell. And they, they've told it really interestingly in this podcast. So do check it out if you want to learn more. Uh, and on that, I will say thank you to all the folks involved in this research. Of course, it's, it's never a, a one person job. There are so many people involved. And um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Very, very, very inspiring. And uh, yeah, uh, thought provoking and lots of ideas and certainly lots of questions, but um, I will not exert uh, uh, the right to ask the first question, but I will ask um, if anybody wants to ask a question, if you need more time to think. I can't see any hands up, so I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, can you perhaps to say a little bit more about uh, what local communities thought about these um, organic rich black soils, but also the conifer trees? What, what's their relation? Yeah, that's a, a, a perfect, I'll start with the conifer trees because, you know, in the kind of scientific way that we studied these, it doesn't fully capture that those conifer forests are very important too. You know, it's not like one is more biodiverse and better and the, it's, it's, it's the, in fact, it's the ecotone between the two that is the most important, right? And on, uh, at some sites on these periphery conifer forests, 
which in fact, periphery, that might even be a pejorative term, but the idea is that you know, we see culturally modified trees. So bark stripped scars, people are using the area at Gixeich. In fact, if I can maybe, um, I wonder if I have any pictures of that. There are, um, here we go. So these forests actually don't entirely look like what you would see in the wild or what you would see if someone had, um, well, basically I'll say, when you're going through a forest in BC, uh, you're either seeing really big, massive, old growth trees, or you're seeing a post logging site where it might look like this, you know, like younger conifer trees, but there's lots of stumps. Here, there's no stumps. It never got to that kind of climax forest. We actually think that people were burning this area, keeping it clear. In all my shovel tests in the conifer forest, there's always charcoal flecking. You know, these areas probably would have been clear at the time, um, but they've now just come in. And, and again, in some cases where there are older conifer trees on the edge of the forest gardens or, or, or you know, within close range to the forest gardens, those were being used. You know, red cedar is kind of the iconic plant of the Northwest coast because it was used just for everything. So um, that's an important point to make it, it. We use it as our quote control, not as part of an experiment. You know, a control is more of a baseline, right? It's something that you look at to say, okay, this is what the conditions are like. We're gonna look at, you know, things that are different from that. So, so really in that sense, um, that's an important point to bring out. And I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, on the soils, it's really interesting. You know, I'm always in a habit of uh, showing things to my colleagues and sci other scientists and researchers. And there's always this kind of, um, oh, wow, this is so revelatory or this is so interesting. And then in community, there's always excitement, but it's kind of like, yeah, we know. Um, I have a, a friend, a colleague who's worked with us on these forest gardens from Kitslis, Hetty, and she says, you know, <laughs> she was talking about the soil like, oh yeah, I just go to this other village site, a place called Endadun on the other side of the canyon. She's like, yeah, I filled my truck up with that soil and brought it to the, <laughs> brought it to my garden at home so it would grow better. And of course, archaeologists would be horrified to hear that someone was digging up midden for their garden, but that it's just part of the con continuity of placemaking. And, and so it's, it's really something that we were not totally surprised about, but folks in Kitsilis were, were really not surprised about, you know, they're using these soils right now. So, yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, and I should have said before, please, uh, anybody who, who, ha who has a question, either post it on the chat or unmute yourself, raise your hands. If you don't want to ask it, you can directly send a message to me or Nick. Um, I can't see everybody. So if anybody has their hand out. Oh, 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 oh I, okay. So uh, uh, Matt and oh, then Paul. I should defer to my elders and betters, I think, Paul. Apologies. No, I, I think that let the youth go first. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And um, Ch Chelsea, thanks for an absolutely wonderful presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I, I mean, I, I had just quite a broad question, which is where do you sort of see this work going in terms of supporting community claims to land, to managing um, botanic resources and gardens, protection, conservation, all of those kinds of questions. How, how do you get people to pay attention to this and really value it? Because it is hugely valuable. Oh, that is a big question. <clears throat> um, you know, I think it's part of my process over the next few years is really democratizing this type of work because Right now, it's kind of, I'm getting calls and emails like, oh, I think we have that here. Can you come down? And I'm kind of, you know, working with folks like Natasha Lyons um, and Alex McAlvey. We're, we're kind of gatekeeping, you know, what is and isn't a forest garden. And we really want to get rid of that and find ways for communities to start documenting these places on their own. Um, and so part of that is, uh, 
like the book we created, right? Is just like, here's the information that we know about these places. Here's how to, you know, do it yourself if you wanna build a forest garden. Um, that kind of process has been really important uh, for us or, or as part of our research program. For the title case, you know, or for land use claims, it the land use or the the rights and title or land claims process in bc is moving at such a crazy pace and so it changes all the time the, the benchmarks for showing title or for proving title are, are constantly changing right now we're in a place where nations um really in a backwards way have to just show they used the land 20 years ago, that would be really hard because people were still under this assumption that, well, they only fished, it was only salmon, you know, complex hunter gatherers. Maybe they're just burning a bit, but, you know, really they're opportunistically harvesting these things. They're not using them in the way that a colonial or European view of cultivation and land use would, would kind of uh, uphold. So, you know, in, in that sense, I think it's a really, compelling way to show a judge right as expert witnesses we're not there to advocate for the community or advocate for the crown we're there to help the judge and so it's a compelling thing to show a judge this is a forest garden you know this is what it looks like here's how old it is here's the composition here's why it's not wild it, it's something that i think a lot of folks can wrap their head around um, and in that help with some really important issues which is which is land title and rights for nations um where it, it it has been unseated it's it's stolen land in a lot of cases so um you know it can go off in a lot of directions i've i've been part of community garden startups in communities where you put all this money into a garden just a regular kind of veggie plot garden and within two years it's kind of like no one's using it anymore there's lots of kind of false starts and things like that and so i think part of this process has been to keep it really slow, keep it really informed, um, keep community informed, I should say, and part of the process of the research along the whole way. Uh, and that's been, you know, so far really successful at Kitsilis. And um, yeah, hopefully we can get more people involved to really democratize it so that we're not kind of the only ones doing it. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Paul, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Chelsea, a, a fantastic uh, presentation, a really textured and you know, amazing, amazing pieces of, of research that you and your collaborators and uh, co-producers um, ha have been doing. I really want to congratulate you on that. <clears throat> this, this question kind of expands a little bit on, on on what you've just said, and and I even began thinking, would in the light of what you've said, <clears throat> is it a fair question to ask? Um, but you know, if you look at these landscapes, and you know, from a, a sort of traditional ecology perspective, these would be called this would be called forest disturbance, and yet from a historical ecology, particularly an archaeologically informed and anthropologically informed. These might be referred to as domesticated landscapes. Um, and there's a really interesting emerging debate, um, certainly within the sort of African side of forest histories, and again being led by the likes of James Fraser and, and James Fairhead, but drawing on also um, work by the Cameroonian uh, historian, for, uh, forest ecologist uh, Francis Nyamjo. Is saying that both of those are actually somewhat inadequate terms for these landscapes because they are both in some sense you know on the disturbed landscapes it's kind of pushes out the role of human agency in the the creation of the the ecosystems and the ecological relationships and yet the domesticated landscape side sort of centers human agency right in there and exclude in, in implicitly kind of excludes all of the other species that are there and what they're arguing is that actually we need to draw on on non-western ontologies of those relationships um, to find an alternative way of understanding these kinds of kinds of landscapes that are you know increasingly documented the world over 
And I just wondered whether there's anything that from native Canadian sort of philosophies of, of human environment relationships that might be a, a useful way of replacing those two terms, which are both in some sense colonial. But the hesitance that I had about asking this question is then, of course, you're saying it's really beneficial within a court structure to be able to say, well, these are humanly created landscapes. So, yeah. A, a well, mixed it's such a good question. And it's nice to see you here, Paul. I'm so it's delighted. I'm happy to see you again. Um, this is such a good question. So before my involvement in this case, I never would have even brought up the idea of hunter gatherers. I killed that idea. It's dead. I don't want to talk about it. But because it keeps coming up in so many ways, and this idea of, you know, the science and the objectivity of it all, again, five years ago, I wouldn't have really um, engaged with a lot of this, but because it's so, it's still, we're, we're not as far along in popular culture, and, and I mean in, in legal cases, in regulatory frameworks on, on management and that sort of thing, it, we're just not there. And so it, it, I really have to do a lot of hand-holding using things like, like you say, this domesticated landscape, or, you know, we were talking about uh, previously with some managers uh, with the province a few weeks ago, we were talking about how these places came to be. And we had to kind of say, well, it's like assisted succession, right? Like trying to kind of put the terms in, in their language. But it's such a good question because there's so much out there on these ideas that come. So a, a New Chalneth example, that New Chalneth case, there's um, an incredible book by Richard Atlio called Tsawak. And Tawak is a new Chalneth idea on how to live within and around a, a, a wooded landscape or with uh, fish relations or how, you know, people, how, how we, how new Chalneth people frame themselves within and around their landscapes and their world. And it's very complex. I can't encapsulate it in like a, um, you know, a, a few sentences here, but, you know, that is the the signpost, the guiding light for how we understand landscapes in New Chalneth territory. And then, as I said, we're in such incredibly diverse regions that it's going to be different from New Chalneth and Tawak. This idea of Tawak, it's going to be different in um, the north in Simshan territory, where, for example, we have the Adao. So the Simshan Adao are the laws. It's it's the laws on how to behave towards you know your family towards your village but also towards the natural world and these are incredible lessons and stories about management kind of tucked in that word management being a problem of course but tucked into these adao are really uh, instrumental values stories ontologies around um, things like forest gardening so for example you know this idea in walter wright's adao who was one of the original um, uh, Nistehawk chiefs of the Kitsilis territory. He talks about, you know, that disasters are large scale disasters like famine, drought, floods. These are the mark of a society that is wise because they've learned lessons on how to, you know, live within them. We would use the word adaptation, but really that's not what he's talking about. It's a very kind of different um, ontology around you know, how to change with a landscape. And in that story on, um, it's called, it's a, an, an oral text, an oral history on how to behave with change. Forest Garden probably talks about, you know, bringing plants into an area, but not letting them overcrowd the ones that want to be there because we have to listen to the plants that want to be there too. So there's, I could go on forever, but I think it's so important you know, if, if there's a sincere effort to include indigenous peoples, you know, it, it, you have to have a kind of consideration of this, especially because it helps express the diversity of these places in really nuanced ways. I could go on forever, but I think it's a fantastic question. And I, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the answer as well. Thank you, Chelsea. Anybody else? Um, so, okay, can I then ask a question myself? Uh, um, so, I 
if I understand correctly, these garden, these forest gardens are entirely dependent on the indigenous community still being there. Or in terms of the persistent, what is the relationship the other way around in the sense, are they serving also, are they also supplying services in terms of contributing to uh, belief systems? What is the relationship at metaphysical level? Do you, will you still have those nation-based communities if these uh, garden, forest gardens would be completely erased or would you have a loss of culture? cultures? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> as far as the kind of metaphysical, I, I don't know if I can speak to that as a settler. It's, it's really tough. Um, what I, what I can say, so that, that first idea that these places, um, you know, don't persist without humans, it, it's true, but it's also, maybe they don't start without humans, but then animal relations become really important in sustaining these places, right? The fact that there's such a striking presence of moose, bear, deer, elk, like they're in there, they're eating those berries, they're propagating them. Like there's this kind of deep connection that goes beyond people plants to include animal relations. And so I think it's, you know, the loss of these types of places I, I don't even want to begin to think about, you know, a lot of these communities are on postage stamp reserves where, you know, the entirety of their territories have been logged. There's been so many, especially in the north, the pipeline developments and LNG expansion has just been exhaustive. Like they've, they've are, there's already so much that's lost that, you know, what is still there is so precious and so important. Um, more like logistically, forest gardens are, are incredible. I mean, that whole archeological landscape that includes the village sites, the forest gardens and the culturally modified trees on the outside, it's like a one-stop shop for your food, but also for knowledge transmission because all the plants are there. You don't have to go to you know all these different places to learn about the different plant species that are in the territory. They're kind of all in one spot. And so it's it's really just, a nice accessible area for knowledge transmission. We bring elders out when we have the youth out. They're interacting, talking, they're seeing the plants, they're eating them, they're looking at the village sites, they're thinking about the cool legacy, the stone tools that you can kick out of the ground. I mean, it's this whole landscape. It's not just the forest gardens, it's, it's really everything. And it's so precious because so much has already been taken um, that I think, in that sense, yeah, it would just be um, a huge loss for these areas not to be protected. And I should say, they are not protected under the Heritage Conservation Act. So the way that we register and protect archeological sites, forest gardens aren't yet recognized, nor are they recognized in the environmental wing of the um, province where, you know, say there's a protected bird species or a rare plant. Um, these are not protected either. So, so it is something to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, I think we have time for a short question, Matt, please. I, I'm loving the discussion. It's fantastic. So sorry if I'm hogging time. No, it's great. But I, I think there's some really interesting connections between Paul's, Paul's question and your responses to that and, and then Federica's. And uh, I mean, in terms of sort of thinking about the, the, the right way to understand how a landscape uh, evolves in one way or another, and the certain terminologies like domesticated or disturbed, they still struggle with that nature culture duality. And, and that's the problem there. And our, our understanding uh, as enlightened as we are, um, and the, with the legal systems taking a long way to catch up with our enlightenment, we still lack the, the capacity really to, to break down that distinction. And uh, quite some time ago, Bill Belay really picked that up um, with a whole discussion around the indigeneity of landscape. And I think yeah. made exactly the same argument that, that you're making here that we, we have to actually deal with a range of indigenous concepts to really understand uh, the, the, that set of relationalities in, in an ecosystem. And I think that ties really neatly to, to Federica's question because 
conservation kind of discourse still continues to see ecologies as having sort of fixed points. There's a start mm-hmm. and an end, and that end point results in a change to something else which is distinct. And so this is a question about how we understand temporality. And archaeology is really bad at creating a view of the world in which we have distinct temporal chunks that have breakages, they're sort of punctuated changes between those temporal chunks. And in reality, when we're talking about ecological relations, we probably need to get rid of the idea of any kind of start or end point. And instead, we're talking about accelerations and decelerations of change. So there is no, um, if we leave these things, they'll, if they'll, they'll cease to be rather it's they will evolve into something else which will always have some kind of anthropogenic marker but which will also become something quite different and I think there's a really interesting question here around temporality and the way in which we understand the nature of change in an ecosystem. Yeah I think that's bang on and it speaks to that idea too of you know archaeologists being horrified that Hetty was taking soil from a site to put in her garden, right? It was it was like, how could you do that? Because it's such a you need to preserve it in a stagnant. This is the thing, right? And and so yeah, I mean that comes up often, and people are often. I, I get asked a lot, you know, well, how old are these places? They want to know how old they are. The legacy is like really important, and I don't think that's as important to people on the ground. They're like, how do we bring them back? How do we start eating this, bringing these to the community and eating them again? And, you know, this is a really ingenious way to manage. Like, let's let's try and do that. That That's more of the interest. But it is such an interesting, almost thought experiment to, to eliminate time from these places in, in general, instead of, you know, focusing on kind of the stages of succession or how, um, you know, when are the conifers encroaching and how, I mean, it's all... Um, it's all very interesting. I think you're 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 bringing up Bill's idea. There is is exactly it. He nailed it, and I think, yeah, it's very pertinent to this. I could go on forever because this is a the the idea of time, the 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 scalar imposition of time is really uh, something we struggle with. So, I appreciate that comment. <laughs> Robert Walls is asking uh, if your book is out and how can it be obtained. Yeah, so uh, there's this book, uh, it, it, it is out, but it's um, for community only. So we wrote a community version where there's lots of information that we didn't want to put out to the public. Uh, but we did write a public facing version, which is just in press now. Uh, we've taken out some of the key information around where to harvest certain plants and the like. Um, and that will be available soon through Athabasca University Press and all Kitsilis owns all the copyright. Uh, they get every penny. It's it's a really truly community book in that light, and so maybe I can send Nick a note when it's out if you're interested in purchasing it. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, please do do let us know when the when the book is out, and um, I think perhaps we should um, we should have a close because we're uh, we're already pa- uh, fifteen past uh, past five. UK time and I don't want to sort of strain uh, Chelsea even further I just wish to uh, call for another round of applause really for a very very stimulating paper much inspiring research and um, yeah and and great discussion so thank you very much uh, Chelsea and I would like uh, to the rest of you remind you please join us next week for our final uh, Garrett seminar. Uh, we we'll have uh, uh, Shoot, uh, Professor Shoot Clavin coming all the way from Amsterdam, being there delivering his paper in person, and he's going to take us to the future of European landscapes through ancient land uses. So please sign up and uh, and, and and join us either in person or online. Once again, um, I wish to thank Chelsea and all of you for participating today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and thanks everyone. Lovely seeing you again. Bye.